Hello and welcome to Intermediate Financial Accounting 2, Tutorial 12a. This is the third tutorial in a series related to accounting for capital and financing leases. This particular tutorial will focus on the leaseor and on accounting for a sales type lease. This tutorial has four key learning objectives. The first will be to calculate lease payments from the leaseor's perspective. Second, to assess all relevant financing capital lease classification criteria, this time for the lessor under both IFRS and ASPE. Third, to prepare the necessary journal entries to account for a sales type lease from the lessor perspective with either an unguaranteed residual or guaranteed residual and where there is no transfer of ownership. And fourth, to prepare a partial income statement illustrating how a sales type lease would be reported on a lease source income statement. This tutorial is based on the Pebbles Company and Bam Bam Inc. B example, so make sure that you have downloaded the correct file. Our first requirement, uh, which is applicable both to requirements 3 and 4 A and B just a little bit later on in this tutorial, is to calculate the lease payment as determined by the lessor, so let's go ahead and do that now. To calculate the lease payment, again, this is always done by the leaseor, and it's the same as in the leasee tutorials 11a and 11b. What we do is we put N for the number of payments. Remember to put your calculator, by the way, into begin mode, because in this example, the lease payments are due at the beginning of the period. The leaseor's implicit rate of interest is 10, so 10 IY. The present value of the equipment being leased is 500,000, but you have to put that in as a negative number, otherwise the calculator will error out, so you usually hit the plus minus button. And the future value is $100,000. Again, we include the residual, whether or not it's guaranteed, so it doesn't matter. And the payment is therefore 83,784. Our next requirement, again, both applicable to requirements 3 and 4 AB, will be to evaluate the relevant leaseor criteria to assess the type of lease to BAM BAM, assuming the company follows either ASPE or IFRS. To assess the lease criteria, and we might as well just list them all. The first two criteria are actually the same as when we covered the leasee criteria, so basically the economic life and the economic value. The economic life looks at the lease term divided by the nine-year life, so we have a seven-year lease term, nine-year life, that's 78%. That's greater than the 75% threshold for ASPE, so definitely a capital lease for ASPE. And we can use the same criteria for IFRS to determine that it's significant. In terms of economic value, the present value is equal to the fair value of the asset, so we end up with 100%. That's greater than 90, so that's a capital lease for ASPE, and it's significant for IFRS. These criteria are specific to the leaseor, so the fact that we have a guaranteed residual that can trigger a capital lease. The collectability is predictable, uh, which basically means that there's no fear of not being able to collect the, the money from the leasee. Uh, there are no cost uncertainties, so there are going to be no surprises in terms of costs that the leaseor might have to incur related to the lease. And the fair value of the asset is greater than its cost. If you look in the data, the fair value is 500000 but the cost to acquire it is something less than that. Um, which basically means that we have a sales type lease. A company can acquire an asset for a certain amount and basically resell it for more for profit, or it can manufacture. Airplane manufacturing companies might sweeten a deal by selling the plane on a lease. So the plane costs a certain amount for the company to manufacture, and then it will earn a profit off of the difference between the cost and the sales price, of course, and then additional revenue by interest through leasing the asset. But at any rate, because the fair value is more than the cost, this means we have a sales type lease. So the company is earning some additional profit, and that's applicable to both ASPE and IFRS. The first two criteria are really the primary ones to assess whether or not you have a capital lease. But these uh, additional criteria uh, down below help confirm it. So our conclusion is that we have a capital lease for ASPE and a financing lease for IFRS. It's a sales type financing lease. We don't make this distinction for the leasee, only for the leaseor. And we have to make sure that we assess these additional criteria. So now we move on to requirement three, where we will Look at preparing the journal entries for BAM BAM to account for the lease for the years 2020, 2021, and to record settlement at the end of the lease term in 2027.
under two scenarios, one where the $100,000 residual is not guaranteed and then where the $100,000 residual is guaranteed. A requirement 3A, lease or accounting with an unguaranteed residual. Since the leaseor's present value is $500,000, there's no need to calculate the present value because if you were to put in the payment for the PMT, the 10% interest, the number of periods, guess what you'd end up with for a PV of $500,000. And also then at the end, we have $100,000 amount remaining as the balance in the account, representing the fact that the residual is not guaranteed because there is no additional payment here. Okay, let's proceed with the journal entries for the leaseor for the first year in January 2020. What's going to happen is on January 1st at the inception of the lease, we'll debit a lease receivable account for the sum of the total anticipated payments. 83,784, which is the payment times seven payments plus the $100,000 residual. All right, we just include that. That means a debit to lease receivable of $686,487. Then the company will debit cost of goods sold for a special amount. These two items in red are very important. So even though the cost of goods sold identified in the problem is 375000 because the residual is unguaranteed, what we must do then is deduct the present value of that residual, the unguaranteed residual. And I've included a little calculation here on the side. We have seven years, 10 IY for interest, but you put in zero for payment and we still have a hundred thousand dollar future value so what this is doing is calculating a simple present value of a lump sum and that pv is fifty one thousand three hundred and sixteen so that's why we deduct it from the cost of goods sold then we credit sales revenue again we're going to have to take the sales revenue if this were sold normally the company would sell for five hundred thousand dollars but because the residual is unguaranteed we must deduct the fifty one thousand three hundred and sixteen and that's because the leaseor will take on some risk and uncertainty and so therefore the amount that can be recognized as revenue and of course the cost matched against that is only the realizable portion at that time and it's that's because the residual is unguaranteed if the residual is guaranteed then the company could recognize the full amount and we'll see that in the next part of this tutorial where we do the same thing but for a guaranteed residual Basically, when the residual is unguaranteed, remember to deduct the present value from both the cost of goods and the sales revenue. The last two are easy. Credit inventory for $375,000. It's presumed, of course, that the company would have either purchased the asset that they're reselling, so they would have uh, credited cash or accounts payable and debited inventory, now we're removing it. If it was a manufactured uh, asset or item, then the company would have basically put it into uh, finished goods inventory. And then the balancing credit would be to unearned interest revenue or unearned interest income for 186487 If you look at the amortization table on the previous slide, the entire interest column adds up to that amount uh, except for $1 because of rounding. Okay, so all that is unearned and that uh, interest revenue will be earned throughout the life of the lease. The next entry, which happens at the same time at inception, is to record the initial payment of the lease by Pebbles. So debit cash, credit the lease receivable for the amount of the payment. That's easy. And then we jump to the end of the year where the company can now record one year's worth of interest income. And so we will debit unearned interest income, credit the interest income or interest revenue for 41622 calculated here and from the amortization table. So the initial present value of the lease minus the first payment, which goes all against principal, times the interest rate of 10%. That's 41,622. And if you've previewed tutorial 11A, then these numbers will be familiar to you. So now proceeding to the next year, 2021. On January 1st, the company will receive cash from the leasee. So it'll debit cash and credit the lease receivable for the amount of the payment, 83,784. Then we jump to the end of the year where the company can now record another year's worth of interest income. So we will debit the under interest revenue or interest income and credit the interest income for 37,405 as shown just right here. 
And that's the calculation as being the original 500,000 minus the amortization of the initial payment, which goes all against basically the principal balance, and then the difference between the second payment and the interest of 42,162 times 10% is 37,405. Then we can jump ahead just prior to the uh, settlement of the lease. We have to record the settlement of the lease on January 1st, 2027. But just before that, we will record the last interest income. If you see what we said before, the total unearned interest revenue over the course of the lease is 186,488. And then just before the settlement of the lease, we have one last interest entry. So debit unearned interest income credit interest revenue for the last amount, uh, 9093, which would be the balance of 90,907 times 10% rounded. Then the last entry on January 1st, 2027, will be to settle the lease. Because the lease has fair value at the time that the lease is completed, $85,000. So that's how much goes back into inventory, right? The company may then sell it or release it or whatever. The lease receivable has a balance of $100,000. So you're going to have to credit the lease receivable to get rid of it. And the difference between the two, of course, is the loss on the lease. Because the residual was unguaranteed, the leaseor takes the loss of the difference between what it's actually worth and the residual that was anticipated. So debit loss on lease, 15000 and this lease is settled. Okay, so now we can proceed to the second part of requirement 3B, which is based on a guaranteed residual. If we do the amortization table for what would be the lease receivable, this will be much the same with the exception that at the end, we have zero in the balance because the residual is guaranteed. So we start with a $500,000 PV, we end up at zero, but notice that the sum of everything in this column is the same and the total payments are the same. So the only difference between the two amortization tables is where the 100,000 is and it acts as a payment. So now, to record this lease at inception on January 1st, 2020, the leaseor will debit the lease receivable for 686487 which was the same as previous, right? The total number of payments, seven payments times 83784 plus the residual of 100000 The company will debit cost of goods sold, but it will do so now for the full 375000 The residual is guaranteed, so therefore the leaseor is not taking on any risk. So therefore, the full amount of the cost and the revenue can be recognized. We're going to credit the sales revenue for $500,000. The inventory gets credited for $375,000 as before, and the unearned interest income will get credited by the difference to make the uh, journal entry balance and also matches what is in the amortization table. The remaining two entries at January 1st to record the cash at inception is the same as uh, with an unguaranteed residual, so it doesn't matter. And the entry at the end of the year to record the interest income is still the same because if you refer back to the amortization table, they're exactly the same except for that last line. So the only difference with a guaranteed residual has to do with the red text where you have the cost of goods sold and the sales revenue where in an unguaranteed scenario, the present value of the residual is deducted from these numbers. Now we can show the rest of the journal entries because the first three are the same and the last one is the only one that's different on January 1st, 2021, to record the receipt of the cash, same as under an unguaranteed residual, debit cash, credit to lease receivable. The entries to record the interest income would be the same uh, under both guaranteed and unguaranteed residual situations. So at the end of December 31st, 2021, the same amount, 37,405, is recorded as income. And then if we jump to December 31st, 2026, just prior to the settlement, Again, the same amount is recognized, and that's because the amortization tables are the same. The only difference is in that last line of the amortization table, and that's reflected right here. At the settlement of the lease, the leaseor will debit the leased equipment inventory for 85000 as it did before. It's going to credit the lease receivable for the 100000 to clear it, and that happened in the previous example as well. But in this case now, instead of taking a loss on the lease, what will happen is the lease or will debit cash for 15000 because the leasee guarantees the residual. So if the fair value of the asset is less than the residual, the leasee makes up the difference. And so that's why cash is debited.
this next slide just shows a comparison of the uh, entries for both unguaranteed and guaranteed residuals at the inception of the lease. As you can see, they're very close, the only difference being the, the cost of goods sold and the sales revenue, where under the unguaranteed residual, the amount of the residual, the PV of the residual of 51,316 is deducted, whereas in the guaranteed residual, the full amount of the cost of goods sold and the revenues are recognized. And the last comparison I want to show is how the entries differ at settlement. So again, with the unguaranteed residual versus the guaranteed, the lease asset inventory is debited in both situations and lease receivable is credited, except that in the unguaranteed residual, the leaseor takes a loss of 15000 And under the guaranteed residual, the leaseor accepts cash from the leasee, which makes up the difference between the value at the settlement and the expected residual value. So those are the only differences. The last requirement is uh, pretty quick. We will just uh, prepare partial income statements for BAM BAM for the year ended December 31st, 2020, and show that for both scenarios, again, where the residual is guaranteed and where it is not. Okay, so the last requirement here, under situations of guaranteed and unguaranteed residual, we can show them both on the same slide. They're pretty straightforward. Based on the two journal entries that we saw before, the sales and the cost of goods sold are the only items that are different. The guaranteed residual can record full sales and full cost of goods sold, where under the unguaranteed residual, they have to be adjusted by the present value of the unguaranteed residual. But notice, in both cases, the gross profit is the same. So whether you have a guaranteed or unguaranteed residual, even though the sales and cost of goods sold numbers are different, the unguaranteed residual reduces both sales and cost of goods sold by the same amount, so you end up with the same gross profit under both scenarios. And the other interest income then is from the amortization table for the amount of interest revenue that can be recognized in that first year. In subsequent years, you won't have sales and costs of goods sold anymore. You'll just have uh, other uh, revenue for interest income. Okay, so now let's just go over with some key points to remember. First, once again, payments are determined by the leaseor and always include the residual guaranteed or not using the leaseor's rate. Be careful because most leases have payments at the beginning of the period, so make sure you set your calculator to begin mode. Uh, always read the data carefully to make sure you're doing what you're supposed to. If the lease payments are at the end of the period, you do not want to have your calculator in begin mode. Next, the lease criteria include the economic life criteria and the economic value as we saw for the leasee. So the same 75% for the economic life and 90% for the economic value are benchmarks for ASPE, and we can use those same benchmarks for IFRS to determine significance. The additional criteria for the leaseor, however, include these items here. So whether or not the residual is guaranteed, if collectability is predictable, that there are no cost uncertainties, and that the fair value is greater than the cost. Right? And this will determine the type of lease the fair value is greater than the cost, then we have a sales type lease, which is what we had in this example. The sales type lease includes sales revenue and adjustments to cost of goods sold and inventory. This is in the entry made at inception of the lease. The differences in accounting for unguaranteed versus guaranteed residuals lie in the initial recording of the lease and its settlement. So at inception of the lease, the cost of goods sold and the sales revenue are both reduced by the present value of that residual when it is unguaranteed. The gross profit remains the same under both scenarios of guaranteed and unguaranteed residuals, and we saw that in the comparison slide. The leaseor does not record any depreciation of the leased asset. This is a common mistake students make when doing journal entries for the leaseor. They include depreciation, but there isn't any because the depreciation is made by the leasee. And in terms of at settlement, the fair value or the appraised value is less than the expected residual. One of two things happens. In the situation of an unguaranteed residual, there is a loss of the difference between those two numbers, between the fair value and the residual, and a loss is recorded by the leaseor when the residual is unguaranteed. If the residual is guaranteed, then the leasee pays the leaseor the difference between the fair value and the residual. So no gain or loss is recorded by the lessor in the situation of a guaranteed residual. This concludes tutorial 12A on sales type leases. You'll want to refer now to tutorial 12B to review accounting for direct financing leases by the leaseor.